Hello and welcome to another teaching, uh, this time on Bible prophecy. I haven't done a Bible prophecy update in a while. Um, I'm going to do things a little different this time. I'm going to be doing a two-part Bible prophecy update. And first, I want to um, build a foundation with respect to the importance of Bible prophecy and what we learn in Scripture um, about by, what the Lord expects of us, right? We're told uh, to despise not prophesying, and we know that from studying, the Bible is about one-third um, uh, prophecy. So we don't want to ignore one-third of the Bible. And when we're told to watch, it's important that we understand what it means uh, to watch, what we're looking for, um, and, and, and some of the things that were left for the church from our Lord that is supposed to be as a comfort to us that we may know his return is near, right? So before we begin, as usual, let's go ahead and begin with prayer. Father, I just thank you so very much for this day and for everything that you have for us, Father. You have not left us orphans. You have given us uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, which is greater than the one in the world. And we have been given power and you have promised never to leave or forsake us. So we just thank you that we belong to you. We ask, Father, that you bless this teaching, that you sanctify it, that it may edify those listening, Father. Place your hedge of protection around us. Keep out the devices, the lies, the confusion, and the arrows of the enemy. In Jesus' name, by the power of Jesus, blood and by God's Spirit, Holy Spirit, have your way. Um, let it be God. God's truth I teach, not mine. But in so doing, I just pray, Father, that every person be filled with Holy Spirit and Holy Spirit fire to be sanctified by your word and truth. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, and all God's children say amen. So when we're looking at the time, uh, the season that we're in, right, we were left signs. Um, we were given signs that we are to look for in order to know when the Lord's return or when the end of the age would be. And so it's important that we don't ignore those that were not kept, caught off guard, as many were in ancient times. Remember, we read that Israel was not ready for their visitation, and we don't want to be caught in the same way um, asleep spiritually or, or worse, blinded. So let's talk a little bit about Bible prophecy. Again, this is Bible prophecy study part one. Um, there will be a part two, and I will see if I get that out either um, tomorrow or sometime during this week. I promise to get that out for you. It is a more detailed uh, Bible prophecy study. This is a very important foundational study. on wh Why is Bible prophecy important? What do we read? What do we learn? What have we been left uh, with respect to Bible prophecy um, from scripture? So first, it's important to understand that in Ecclesiastes 3.1, we read, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Um, God has an order. Um, the Lord, we read, declared the end from the beginning. We know that there are many um, prophecies from the Old Testament that Jesus himself fulfilled. And we know also that the Old Testament also still has prophecies that have not yet been fulfilled, but that if you are awake spiritually, you see the puzzle pieces, the prophetic puzzle pieces aligning themselves in our time, um, in this hour before our eyes. And it's something we should not ignore because it's indicative of the time at hand. Um, in Ephesians 1.10, we always read that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. So there are dispensation of fullness of times. It's a thing. You know, today you, re you hear a lot of back and forth um, from many who argue um, the rapture view and the timing of it. Um, and they, if they hear um, dispensation, many who do not believe, for example, in a pre-tribulational uh, rapture will argue that it's unbiblical. Well, no, it is very biblical. Um, there are fullness of times, plural. Um, there are ages that the Lord um, himself uh, governs. And today we are in the church age of grace. 
And we're going to talk a little bit about that because um, the Bible, uh, Jesus himself, rather, he explained to us um, that there were uh, um, dispensation, there were certain um, fullness of times that began with something and ended with something. And he let us know from this to this, it was this, you know, but now, you know, we, we, we will see the details of those dispensational fullness of times um, to some extent. And just so that you understand, God has an order. An order is established in scripture with respect to the prophecies of the Bible. And if we step out of that order, our study of end time, our eschatological studies will be off and we cannot ignore the details of scripture. Treat the Holy Bible delicately, be very careful. Um, not to add or take away from what is actually there and to study and rightly divide as we are instructed. And furthermore, <clears throat> I always share Isaiah 28, 9 and 10 um, gives us instructions as to how we come to understand doctrine, taking precip upon precip, which means order, line upon line, here a little, there a little, like pieces of a puzzle. We're gathering information from various parts of the Bible to get a prophetic picture of said event, of said subject that we're studying. Um, i.e. rapture, okay? Um, in Romans 5.14, for example, we read, <clears throat> excuse me, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So from death reigned from Adam to Moses, that's a, a certain time that death reigned. It's a, it's a segment of time, a season. And we can't ignore that that's established in scripture, that we read uh, time and again of, of seasons, of times, of ages, of, of a, uh, an increment of time where something was different, where something was happening, where some, um, uh, something governed that time. And it's something that we shouldn't ignore. In Luke 16, 16, we read, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presses into it. Listen, um, there is something different that happened uh, when John the Baptist began to prepare the way for the coming Messiah. And then when the Messiah presented on the earth, something changed. And we cannot ignore, again, there are dispensational fullness of times. There are certain ages. You know, there are certain segments of time, seasons and times that the Lord has established. And everything will happen in the order that God said it will happen. We have to make sure that we humble ourselves as a, as a child and read what is actually there. The word of God comes with meaning in it already. We don't need to put meaning into the word of God. What we need to do is humble ourselves as a child and receive that which God has for us, which is as a seed. And when it falls on good ground, it will bear fruit. Remember, the word of God is like a seed that when it falls on good ground, it will bear fruit. The Holy Spirit will provide the increase when you ingest that spiritual food that is the bread of life, right? So, you know, in Ephesians 2, 7, we read, that in, the that in the ages, pardon me, to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. The word here, ages, uh, it's plural. I'm going to show you the original word in a moment. Um, in Ephesians 3, 5, we read, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit. Um, there, today we are in the church age of grace. We're in the acceptable year of the Lord. And remember, we've explained this to you before in other videos. When we read in Luke 4, um, what Jesus declared after he was baptized and after he was tested of the enemy, tempted of the enemy, remember? He went into the synagogue and he declared the acceptable year of the Lord. And if you go to Isaiah 61, which is where the Lord read from, you see that the good news are, are, are mentioned there. Even in Luke 4, you read that he is, telling, he is telling the people of earth, he was telling the, the Jews at that time in the synagogue, 
what he was about to do, right? And, and he mentions the good news. And, and you need to understand that he let us know what was about to happen by making that declaration. When you look at the original word for acceptable, it means favor. Remember that grace means favor, kindness. Um, when you read acceptable year, that word year in the original language means age. We are in the acceptable year of the Lord in the church age of grace. The Holy Spirit began to do something different at Pentecost. He began to indwell and seal the church that Jesus built and purchased with his precious blood. We became the temple of God on the earth, where before Pentecost, there was a human temple that was made with human hands that remember the Holy of Holies, remember only a high priest can enter, and anybody who was not worthy to go in and enter in there um, died. And so you, you have to understand the privilege and honor that we have today as children of God in this church age of grace, in this acceptable year of the Lord, that we're able to come to the Lord boldly and pray in Jesus' name, our high priest, right? Um, so the word ages, which is what I want to look into now, is the Greek strong concordance 165. A-I-O-N, I'm going to guess an enunciation, so forgive me if I butcher it, Aeon, Aeon, um, and it means a space of time, an age. Um, when we look at the usage, uh, this is Bible Hub, by the way, um, in the Strong Concordance information, we read it's an age, a cycle of time, especially of the present age, <clears throat> excuse me, as contrasted with the future age and of one of a series of ages stretching to infinity. We've read already ages in the plural. We've read um, the other ages. So some have passed. You know, there are seasons and times appointed. There are dispensation of fullness of times. And it is set in an order when it comes to the prophecies of the Bible, which many miss. Okay. Um, here in the Helps Word Study, again, the same word that was translated to ages uh, in our Bible is the 165 Aeon. And what I like about Word Study is that it gives you the base root words and it, and it um, tells you, it, you get deeper meaning when you read the Helps Word Study. And so there you see properly an age era, time span, characterized by a specific quality, type of existence. Um, and then it gives an example. Christians today live in the newer age of the covenant, the time period called the New Testament. It is characterized by Christ baptizing all believers in the Holy Spirit, i.e. engrafting all believers into his uh, mystical body and all the marvelous privileges that go with that. Remember, we were, um, the Gentiles were grafted into the family of God through faith in Christ, right? He is our only door, the only way um, that we enter into the presence and throne of God um, because of Jesus' finished work on the cross and because we have um, confessed with our mouth and believed in our hearts that, that he was raised from the dead. And we have invited Jesus into our heart and we've believed and so we have been gifted with the Holy Spirit, right? Which gives us eyes to see and ears to hear with a heart and mind to understand wisdom from above. Remember that the Holy Bible was put together because holy chosen men of God spoke as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. You know, remember that the words that Jesus spoke are the words of eternal life, Peter said. Jesus himself said the words that he speaks, they are spirit and they are life. These words sanctify us and they are also part of our spiritual armor. It is the sword of the spirit, right? And so the holy word of God, that is one third, about one third prophecies, one third prophetic, we have to be very careful how we study and that we do not step outside the order established in scripture, right? Um, in Colossians 1 26, we read, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Again, ages, plural, 
okay? Um, I wanted to include this. This is from uh, one of my favorite websites, gotquestions.org, and we read, what is the age of grace? The age of grace, also called the dispensation of grace or the church age, age excuse me, is the sixth divinely apportioned dispensation of world history according to dispensationalism. Dispensationalism is a system system theologians use to divide and categorize historical events in the Bible. Most agree that there are seven dispensations, though some believe there are nine or three. The age of grace is the dispensation that is occurring right now in history. It began with the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, and is made possible by Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross, his resurrection, and his ascension. The grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people, according to Titus 2.11. We continue reading in the same uh, website. Salvation has always been by the grace of God, received by faith. In the dispensation of law, God required his people to follow the law of Moses and offer sacrifices for their sins, for their sin, excuse me, sacrifices that pointed forward uh, to the gracious provision of the Lamb of God. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, during the age of grace, we are not under the law, but under grace. The law has been fulfilled and God's grace in Christ is plain for all to see. All that is required for salvation is to trust in Jesus Christ. He has done all that is necessary for salvation. Um, so one thing that I want to add to that, um, and they've done a fine job of, of giving you a synapsis, right, of the, of the um, church age of grace. One thing I want to add is we have been given the privilege and honor to by grace through faith become part of the family of God and receive the benefits that come with that, right? Um, however, what many are doing wrong, there are some people that are trying to teach that the church must be purified in the great tribulation, and that is why she has to go through that. That is wrong. And that is not a correct interpretation um, because to, to say so is to teach a works salvation and we are not saved by works. Do you understand? Jesus work on the cross did not need our help for us to go and die when death is an enemy of God. Do you understand? Um, we are told that we are saved through faith by grace period, right? But we also know that there are many warnings the Lord has given us on why and how we should be saved. And that is probably going to take us left. So I'm going to stop there, but understand there will be a teaching on 1 Corinthians 3, where you read that there are some who will be saved by reward, and there are some who will suffer loss yet be saved so as by fire. I want to get into that, and I may do a video of that um, possibly next week, because I think it's important that we see the difference between getting saved by reward and getting saved, um, so, uh, suffering loss, yet so as by fire. There is a very important um, teaching in 1 Corinthians 3 that many miss, and, and I think it's important that, that it warrants a teaching all on its own so that I can give the proper time to it. So I, I don't want to deflect. I don't want to um, go away from uh, today's study on um, Bible prophecy and the importance of it. So just know that there is a video um, that I have on schedule to do possibly next week that will exp explain 1 Corinthians 3 with scripture, okay? So in Ephesians 3, 2 to 6, we read the following. This is Paul. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages, plural, was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, that the Gentiles, non-Jews, 
should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Okay. So again, dispensation of, of the fullness of times, dispensation of the grace of God, it is a thing. There are ages, there are seasons and times appointed to all things under heaven. We cannot ignore that when we are studying the prophecies of God. You know, I, I got this chart from prophecylandmarkbiblebaptist.net. I do not know them. I have no affiliation with them, but I thought the chart was very um, interesting and depicted well what many are teaching when it comes to uh, what is coined dispensationalism, right? So we read, let me kind of make it bigger there. They've numbered the times. And what I want you to pay close attention to is not so much in titles and get hung up on words and verbiage, but I want you to see the distinct differences between those times that have existed since Adam and Eve and times have changed things have changed it's not god who has changed but according to the way that god is doing things on earth there is an order there is a reason there is a purpose for it all um you know god is god's ways are higher than our ways you know we cannot compare our limited um human existence and intellect to everything that god is and everything that god knows he is beyond our scope of completely understanding. Um, in fact, Jesus in John 14 says, we will not understand until that day that he comes for us to take us to that place at his father's house, how he is in the father, we in him and he in us. There are things that we are not going to understand until Jesus return. Remember that we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, which is Jesus, then that which is in part shall be done away. But here we see in the age of what they call the age of innocence in Genesis one through three, and they say that it lasted about 33 years. The responsibility and, 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 and the command from God, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, um, toward that human man and woman that was Adam and Eve, and they failed. Um, they ate from the forbidden tree, and there were consequences to that action. They were banished from Eden, um, entropy and death instituted. So then we have the age of conscious, what they call the age of conscious, and they refer to the Genesis 3, 6 to 7 and 33, they say it lasted 1,623 years. Um, do good, blood animal sacrifices. Man did wickedness and violence. Remember in ancient times, they turned away um, um, from what God commanded of them. They, they began to go into idolatry. They began to um, conform to the ways of the world around them, right? What we ourselves, the Christians today, have to understand the people of God, period, today are told, do not conform to the ways of the world. Um, do not love the world. Um, to become a friend of the world is to become an enemy of God. Um, it's, it's seen as spiritual adultery, right? Because we know who's the one right now who's running things in the world. We know why we are seeing such wickedness grow and good is being called evil and evil is being called good, right? We're not blind to the things happening in the world right now, those who are spiritually awake. And so men did uh, wickedness and violence and uh, there was a worldwide flood. Um, what happened in the third dispensation, civil government, and they cite uh, Genesis 8, 22, 11, 9. They say it lasted 429 years. Um, they were told to disperse and multiply. Men settled in the plain of Shinar to build a tower. Um, they were dispersed by confounding men's one language because they used to speak. It's hard for us to imagine that at the Tower of Babel, uh, before the Tower of Babel, um, before they began to build that tower, right? And do things to reach the heavens, right? Um, and all that that entails, um, because there is some mystery behind a lot of that, unless you sit down and you really study the meat of it, right? Um, there was, everybody spoke the same language. But then something happened. And as a result from what was happening during that time that they built that tower, um, then the Lord um, sought to confuse the languages. <clears throat> so all these fights that we see today, nation against nation, right? Because nation, the word, 
uh, originally um, is where we get our word um, nationality from. And in the original language, it just means racist. We're seeing a lot of different uh, cultures and races come against each other today. There's fighting. Isn't that prophetic? Um, look at Matthew 24. Um, aside from the wars and rumors of wars, kingdom against kingdom and nation against nation, uh, which means racist, we're right on line and nothing is out of control right now. Everything that the Lord said was going to happen um, as a consequence, right, um, indicates the time at hand, the season we are in. And, and we shouldn't ignore that because Jesus gave us signs to look for in order for us to know when his return was near and when we were approaching the end of the age. And you can read that in Matthew 24. So here we see that the languages were um, confused as a result. You know, um, number four, the dispensation number four, uh, they call it a promise. And they cite Genesis uh, 11, 9, Exodus 19. They say it lasted 430 years. Uh, the responsibility was for them to dwell in Canaan. Uh, this, this, they put a parenthesis, this dispensation zeroes in on the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, they moved to Egypt, Egyptian bondage. Um, then uh, number five was the law, Exodus 20, Luke 16, 16. Lasted 1,524 um, years, excuse me. Uh, they were told to keep and do the law of Moses. Israel broke the law. Um, Christ was crucified. Worldwide dispersion of, of Israel. They rejected their promised Messiah. Um, and then now we are in the church age of grace. John 3, 29 to 31. Revelation 4, 1, they cite. Uh, it's about 2,000 years. Um, uh, the responsibility, preach salvation through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, keep the Bible and doctrine pure, um, church responsible. Um, today we have many false doctrines and, and, and there are uh, many, remember we read in, in, I believe it's 2 Timothy, that will depart the faith and, and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Um, there are many that, remember, Jesus said, few will find the straight gate and narrow way that leads to life. Many will enter through the wide gate and broad way that leads toward destruction. Today, there is so much deception. There are many false prophets, false teachers, wolves in sheep's clothing. And there are many behind pulpits that are filled with pride, relying on their own um, knowledge and remember, pride is an abomination to God and the Lord resists. And many are making merchandise of God's people. That will not go unpunished according to the word of God. And so you see, there are consequences to us going in disobedience to what the Lord has instructed us to do. Um, we're given an unction. We're given a... Uh, uh, um, as ambassadors for Christ, we're supposed to be a light in this world. We're supposed to be the salt of the earth. But that's not what we see today, is it? A lot of times, um, few are those that are truly getting in the Bible, studying the Bible, taking God's word serious, and being faithful to Christ. It's very easy to conform to the ways of the world. It's very easy to fall for false... Um, misinterpretations if you're one who does not study the word jesus said man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes out of the mouth of god we have to study we have to rightly divide we're commanded to do so because when you know the truth you got that belt of truth in you as part of your um, um uh spiritual armor and the belt remember holds all our other armor um, in place. It holds your sword, which is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That belt of truth, when you have the truth in you, don't, I mean, when you have a belt on, you feel secure anyway, right? Especially if you have big trousers on, you have your belt on, you feel pretty secure, don't you? Um, you're not going to be ashamed, right? It should those trousers fall off if your belt is not secure. When we know the truth, um, we're better able to recognize the deception, the lies when they confront us. Um, when we are rooted and, and, and standing firm, nothing wavering on what God said, 
when we are spiritually awake and watching, um, that individual um, is in obedience to what God said. He told us to watch. He told us to, um, you know, when you read about uh, the warnings that were given with respect to false teachers and false preachers and wolves in sheep's clothing, listen, they don't come with warning labels. There are no neon flashing lights that are going to tell you, huh, you know, false prophet, false teacher, wolf in sheep's clothing. They're going to be um, resembling, um, just like we read Satan who comes disguised as an angel of light. Um, you, you have to be very careful and, and please get into the word of God. Why wouldn't you want to get in the word of God when we read the word of God is a light unto our feet, right? A lamp unto our feet. Um, we read that the word of God sanctifies. The sanctification speaks of um, it sets you apart as holy unto God. The word of God is a seed, right? That when it falls on good ground, it will bear fruit unto um, um, God, which glorifies our father in heaven. The, the word of God is part of our spiritual armor. It's the sword of the spirit. So we have a lot to contend against these days because, listen, the enemy, you shine bright in the unseen. He's coming at you with every dart he can, he can throw. And he's looking for you to leave an, an opportunity door open. You know, when we sin, when we um, um, do things knowing that we're sinning and it's against God, it's, it's sort of open spiritual doorways. You know, you have to... Um, confront that sin and and remember that we have power over all the powers of the enemy we have um what we need to be able to overcome in this world uh, many people will allow the enemy a foothold listen there's a reason why we're given armor there's a reason why we're told to be careful because satan roars around as a lion looking to whom whom he can devour it's not that he can devour you physically if you're a child of god but he can try and plant seeds of confusion and lies um, he can try to lure you away with your favorite flavor of sin do you understand so he he he's aiming to break marriages he, he came to steal kill and destroy and you have to be vigilant you have to be watching you have to be not only watching for the signs that were given but also watch um, because there's a snare around the corner do you understand and so we are called to make christ our our foundation um, jesus who is the word of god made flesh right and and it's important there is such importance in in studying scripture and please if you're a child of god and you don't get into the bible regularly i urge you to do so if you're only dependent on man we all fall short of the glory of god don't even take my word for it but study study and rightly divide um and study and rightly divide in the way that we're instructed in isaiah 28 9 and 10 as to how we come to understand doctrine now here they cite number seven as the future kingdom that will last a thousand years right we're told to trust and obey uh king jesus um uh satan will be let loose uh after the thousand year reign um now another thing that i don't think many people realize is that after um, the church age, remember the acceptable year of the Lord that the Lord declared, Jesus, when he was reading off of Isaiah 61, when he declared the acceptable year of the Lord, the church age of grace, he closed the book, not yet reading what follows the acceptable year of the Lord, which is the days of vengeance. If you have been with me before and you've read uh, uh, several of my previous videos, you know that the days of vengeance begin during that seven-year period that is the 70th week of daniel's prophecy that has the great tribulation and the time of jacob's trouble in it i would refer you to luke 21 and matthew 24 do a comparison you will find that much of luke 21 mirrors matthew 24 which describes the events before during and after the great tribulation and what luke 21 calls days of great distress uh, vengeance and wrath Matthew 24 calls the great tribulation. Please go and, 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 and take, you know, take notes, draw yourself a chart, and you will see um, the days of vengeance begin during the 70th week. Okay. Um, so to me, I would have thought that would be a dispensation or a season, 
and a time in the order of what God has for the prophecies, um, but that's just my opinion. Okay, so for those of you that want to study the prophecies of the Bible more in depth, in depth, especially for what's coming, right? What follows the church age of grace. What you want to do is you want to go ahead and study, I would recommend highly the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. Um, I also would not ignore the prophets of the Bible because they give you little nuggets about that time within their prophecies, okay? And I want to remind you that in Revelation 1-3, um, we read, blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. So we receive blessings for reading and hearing the words of this prophecy. Listen, I will read the book of Revelation and I will go also go to YouTube and they have audio. They have it in audio form for the King James, which is my favorite. Um, and, and you can have it read to you. So you can hear it and you can read it to receive a double portion of that blessing. And how many of us don't want a double portion of the blessings? So that's what I would rec recommend for you. Um, I also want to tell you this. Be very, very careful when you're studying God's word not to add or take away from what is there. I will point you to Revelation 22 where Jesus himself gives, he, he puts his name to it, and he puts a very, very serious warning, a warning against those that add to or take away from what is written in this last book of the Bible. Why? Because if you study the book of Revelation, and again, we're going to be, we're going to be starting a series um, on the seven letters to the seven churches, I'm going to say this week, but I'm not sure. I do have a lot of studies lined up, and I, I have that in there somewhere. I don't have it in front of me, but we will be doing a study on the seven letters to the seven churches. But here's what I want to tell you. Revelation 1, um, John is told, is given an order, right, of how he's going to write down what he is given in the revelation of Jesus Christ, the unveiling. That's what revelation means in the original Greek, unveiling. Okay, and, and he's told, write down the things you see, write down the things which are, and write down the things which shall be hereafter in the future, right? And we know that in Revelation 1, he sees um, Jesus amid seven golden candlesticks, and we're told what that represents in chapter 1. Uh, Revelation 2 and 3 um, depicts the condition of the churches in the church age of grace, right? Which started at Pentecost and we're still in it, right? And, and you will see seven letters to seven churches that existed um, in that time. However, at the end of each letter, there is a, a phrase that repeats itself. And uh, we read, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, says unto the churches, plural. So there is a message there for the church that exists during this church age of grace. In each one of those letters, there is prophetic value. And the reason that it's in the beginning of that holy book, the final book of the Bible, that you receive blessings for hearing and reading. So John is told, write down the things which you see, uh, that the, the things which you see, which is Revelation 1, the things which are Revelation 2 and 3, the condition of the churches and the church age of grace, and the things which shall be hereafter, which is Revelation 4 onward, which depicts um, what will be happening on earth and what will be happening in heaven during the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy and beyond. And you know this because in Revelation 4, 1, um, uh, John is told, come up hither and I will show you the things which shall be hereafter, okay? Um, but what I want to point out in Revelation 22 is that of all the warnings you receive, this is a very serious warning that you are not to add or take away from the things which are written in this book. And Jesus warns in the following manner. In Revelation 2, 16 to 19, we read, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the Spirit, Holy Spirit, and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is athirst come, and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. 
for I, this is Jesus, for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. What plagues? I would refer you to go read the seven seals, seven bowls, seven trumpets, seven thunders. Seven thunders are a bit of a mystery because John was not allowed to write um, those details in the book. However, the three that I've mentioned before, the seals, the, the, the trumpets, and the bowls, go and read that and you will know what it is that the Lord is, is saying. You will be cast into the great tribulation. Um, and what we read in 19 is, and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, listen, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Very serious warnings. Be very careful how you handle the book of Revelation especially, but the Bible in general, you are not to speak idly. Um, to speak idly about any part of the Lord's truth uh, is to receive uh, uh, consequences. You will give account at the time of judgment, we read, right? Um, so be very careful how you handle the Lord's word. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, okay? Now, uh, a very intriguing thing that we read in Revelation 19, in the latter half of Revelation 19, is for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Okay, and in First Thessalonians five twenty to twenty two, we read, "Despise not prophesying; prove all things; hold fast that which is good; abstain from all appearance of evil." And I I want to just look a little deeper in in uh, twenty. Despise not prophesying. So we see that the word despise was the um, Greek uh, Strong's Concordance. I am not going to try to enunciate that, but what it means, the 1848, is to despise, to treat with contempt. Um, I said it not, ignore, despise. And then we look at the helps word uh, studies, um, and it tells us it comes from the word 1537. I'm just going to say the number. Um, completely out from, uh, which intensifies, bring to naught, reduce to nothing, uh, properly cast out as nothing, set at naught, to count as nothing, to treat with utter contempt as zero, set at naught, despise utterly, to regard something as lacking any standing value. So I think you get my point from here. So despise not prophesies the prophecies of the Holy Bible. Do not despise them. Despise them not, okay? Um, don't make them as an unimportant thing. Don't make them as, as something to ignore, something to despise, right? Something to, that is zero value, nothing. Do not do that, it says in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.20. So when we think about prophesying, it's the word uh, 4394 prophetia, um, and it means prophecy, um, the gift of communicating and enforcing revealed truth, um, the HELPS word study um, has it as um, 4396, the root word it comes from 4396, which means prophet, which is derived from um, 4253, which means before. So make clear, assert as priority properly what is clarified beforehand. Prophecy, which invo involves divinely empowered foretelling, um, asserting the mind of God or foretelling prediction. Um, it's not speaking of uh, the wicked stuff you know it's not speaking of tarot and and all of that that comes from satan you know um um it's it's holy biblical prophecies that holy chosen men of god spoke as the holy spirit gave them utterance and so the prophecies of the holy bible written in this holy book come from god it is not an unholy thing and not to be confused with something like astrology or something like that an abomination that that the Lord um, is disgusted with. It's not that stuff. This is holy truth from above, holy wisdom from above by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we're told not to despise these truths, these holy revelations from God, okay? Um, not to ignore them, not to make them something as unimportant, okay? Um, we cannot forget in Joel 2, uh, 28, 32, what we read. The prophet Joel uh, writes, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will 
and this is, uh, he's, remember, holy chosen men of God spoke as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. So the Lord's truth reads, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord has said in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Remember that um, there are three distinct groups in the book of Revelation, who are shown who shall have the privilege and honor to sing to Jesus at three different times. The church is seen in Revelation 4 and 5, crowned, clothed in white raiment, which speaks, speaks of glorification, um, singing the new song of redemption by Jesus, blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. And they are seen in heaven, seated on the throne, joined tears with Christ, um, before Jesus even opens the first seal. Uh, and so that's before the start of the seven year period. And then we see the 144,000 remnant of the children of Israel, speaking of Jacob, 12 tribes. They shall sing a song only they will know, Revelation 14. They are just getting sealed while they're on the earth. During the 70th week, they're the remnant, the 144,000 are the remnant that Romans 11 tells us um, today in this church age of grace, they are blinded for unbelief temporarily until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, right? And so um, they uh, shall sing a song only they will know. And they're seen in uh, the beginning of Revelation 7, 1 through 4, I believe it is, and uh, Revelation 14. And then we see the tribulation saints. Um, Revelation 6, 9, Revelation 7, 9, and in Revelation 15, they shall sing the song of Moses. So three distinct groups in three different times, uh, and the tribulation saints come out of the great tribulation because they were cast into it. You cannot come out of something if you were not first in it, okay? Um, so we can't ignore, there's an order, there's an order of events in the way that they will happen. And we have to pay attention to the details when we're studying the prophecies of the Lord. So here I wanna transition on something else because I think this is pretty extraordinary. We read the following. According to the Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy by J. Barton Payne, there are 1,239 prophecies in the Old Testament and 578 prophecies in the New Testament for a total of 1,817. These prophecies are contained in 8,352 of the Bible verses. Since there are 31,124 verses in the Bible, the 8,352 verses that contain prophecy constitute 26.8% of the Bible's volume, about one third of the Bible. Um, something else I wanna show you with respect to the prophecies that Jesus himself fulfilled from the Old Testament. We read the following, and this is from CBN. Down through history, God provided us a roadmap. He foretold various signs and conditions through his prophets. These prophets spoke of things that mankind should watch for so that the Messiah would be recognized and believed. These signs or prophecies were given to us in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the part of the Bible written before Jesus was born. Its writings were completed in, uh, I would add in about 450 BC. The Old Testament written hundreds of years before Jesus' birth contains over 300 prophecies that Jesus him fulfilled through his life, death and resurrection. Mathematically speaking, the odds of anyone fulfilling the amount of prophecy are staggering. Mathematicians, mathematicians put it this way. One person fulfilling eight prophecies, the odds of that, one in, I had to look this up for 15 zeros after that 100 because I've never counted that high, 100 quadrillion. One person fulfilling 48 prophecies, the odds, one chance in 10 to the 157th power. One person fulfilling 300 plus prophecies, only Jesus, the son of the living God. Hallelujah. It is the magnificent detail of these prophecies that mark the Bible as the inspired word of God. 
Only God could foreknow and accomplish all that was written about the Christ. This historical accuracy and reliability sets the Bible apart from any other book or record. The New Testament was written after the death of Jesus Christ. Archaeologists have found thousands of manuscripts of the New Testament. Some of these pieces of manuscripts are dated less than 100 years after the original letters were written. In terms of historical reliability, the Bible is superior to any other ancient writings. So here, <laughs> I just wanted to put it in perspective what 100 quadrillion <laughs> looks like. So um, that's 15 zeros. So it's 100 quad quadrillion, if you didn't believe me. <laughs> and then to, to, for those of us who have never um, counted that high, um, first comes billion with nine zeros, trillion with 12, and then quadrillion with 15 zeros after the 100. Uh, and quantillion is 18 zeros. Um, so 15 zeros for quadrillion. And I, I just thought that was just mind boggling. Um, so the odds, now that you see that, the odds of one person fulfilling only eight, let alone, not, not, not even to 300, but eight prophecies, one person fulfilling eight prophecies, the odds of that is one in 100 quadrillion quadrillion. Yes, I said it right there. Um, and I just thought that was fascinating. So here, I want to talk a little bit about the time we're in, the church age of grace, right? After Jesus was baptized, after he was tempted and tested of the enemy, right? And he had victory over him. Um, the enemy fleed, right? Because he couldn't, he couldn't, he just couldn't with the word of God, excuse me. And so Jesus came into the synagogue, and he de declared what he was about to do on the earth, the time at hand, the acceptable year of the Lord, okay? Um, we'll read that in Luke 4, 17 to 21, and we read, And there was delivered unto him, him, Jesus, the book of the prophet Isaiah, um, and it's spelled E-S-A-I-A-S, -A -A and I forgot there was a distinct reason I read why, and I don't remember, so I'm not going to. <clears throat> try to go by memory, excuse me, but it's the prophet Isaiah that we know uh, of with an I. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. That's the good news to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Again, acceptable in the original language means favor. Grace means favor and kindness. Year in the original language means age. So we're in the church age of grace. We're in the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. So Jesus closed the book after declaring the acceptable year of the Lord. And he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. He declared the acceptable year of the Lord, the new, the new time that had um, started then. Okay? So in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, this is where the Lord read from. And I want to show you something. Um, Jesus read from Isaiah 61, and we read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings, that the good news, the gospel, unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So um, he, sorry, I lost my place. Um, <clears throat> so acceptable means um, favor. Grace means favor, kindness. Year means age. Um, we, we are in the acceptable year of the Lord, the church age of grace. But the Lord closed the book. Let me get my little pointer out. He closed the book right here, not reading 
what followed the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance, right? And you can get yourself a hint as to when that time starts when you um, cross-reference Luke 21 and Matthew 24, because remember, Luke 21, much of Luke 21 mirrors Matthew 24, which describes the events before, during, and after the Great Tribulation. And again, what you will see is that what um, Matthew 24 calls the Great Tribulation, Luke 21 calls the days of great distress, uh, vengeance and wrath, okay? One in the same, vengeance begins during the 70th week, that next season, that next uh, segment of time that follows after the last day of the Church Age of Grace, okay? So on the last day of the Church Age of Grace, and I would refer you to the Rapture series, and I will try to remember to link them in the description area of this video. Um, the Church goes up at the last day of the Church Age of Grace, um, we go up at the rapture uh, before the start of the seven-year period, okay? The church will not be here on the earth during any part of that seven-year period. And I show you the Bible proof of this during, uh, uh, with my um, rapture series, I, I use scripture, okay? I only believe in using scripture, which is why my videos are very long. Um, and I make no apologies because many people can say many things. Um, what you want is make sure to make sure that what you are being told is what actually came from God. So you want the scripture that proves what a person, that supports what a person is saying. If ever you hear something come out of the words of any person claiming that it's from God, you are in your right to say, can you please uh, show me in scripture where you get that from? You know, there's a nice way to ask. There's a nice way to confront the situations. Iron sharpens iron. We want to make sure that we're getting the truth from God, that we're like the Bereans, which when they heard something, they looked in the word of God to make sure that what they were being told was scriptural. Okay. So um, I, I wanted to point out again, uh, Jesus closed the book where you see that red arrow. Um, and he did not read yet. He did not declare the day of vengeance because it has not started. We are in the acceptable year of the Lord, the church age of grace, that time between the 69th week of Daniel's prophecy, which are weeks of years, right, that have passed, and between the, the 69th and the 70th week, that seven-year period. We are in the church age of grace, the prophetic gap, as many call it, okay? Um, so in... Luke 21, uh, this is where I was telling you, I just took a little screenshot so I could show you just a little bit of where I get the days of vengeance begin during that seven year period. Remember that in Matthew 24, um, we read uh, from 15 to 21, we read the following. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is in the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And what do we read in Luke 21? First of all, let me get my pointer out. You see this part here? Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Okay, now watch this. Parallel, right here. Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst of it depart out and let not them that are in the countries enter there into for these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled but woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people what do we read oops on the other side uh, and woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days, but pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall be great tribulation. What Matthew 24 calls the great tribulation, Luke 21, speaking of that same time, calls the days of vengeance, great distress, and wrath upon the people there at that time. And, and as a side note, just so you know, 
Um, who are those that uh, are in Judea? Who are those that follow the Sabbath? Um, this is a, a, a verse, and it's speaking to the Jewish remnant of the 144,000, not the church. Do you understand? Um, the Matthew 24, in Matthew 24, we're given the beginning of sorrows, right? We're told how we, how things will begin, how we will, how the, you know, remember the question that, jo that um, Jesus has asked. He's asked, um, when shall these things be? Tell us what will be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the age, right? It says some versions, some versions say end of the world, but when you look at the original language, it's speaking of age, the end of the age, right? When shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the age? This segment of time we're in, the church age of grace, right? Um, and Jesus begins to tell them, you know, make sure that nobody deceives you. Um, many shall come in my name and, and, and shall deceive many. We do see many people claiming to be Christ today and they've got followers. Um, and these people are, um, why are they deceived? Well, because they have not read their Bibles. Because had you read their Bible, where you, whether you're speaking of the rapture or you're speaking of the second coming, the Lord presents himself above in, in the clouds for both events. And yes, there is a difference between the two events. And again, I, I, please, I, I plead with you, I refer you um, so that you can uh, listen to the videos that I have made on the rapture, studied and rightly divided. And I can show you um, even in the videos that I have titled, Why I Do Not Believe in Mid-Tribulation, Why I Do Not Believe in Post-Tribulation, my aim is to edify. My aim is not to um, sneer or poke fun of or, or in pride. I don't have a prideful bone in my body. It's to humbly edify, to show you the truth so you do not speak idly, so you do not keep confusing the people of God with these misinterpretations because I'm sorry, they are misinterpretations. And I plead with you to go and, and check the video out before you say yay or nay. Okay, um, so we see here then that uh, these are parallel verses and the days of vengeance um, will begin during the seven year period. Okay, it's a time of, of vengeance and wrath. And we know that Nahum 1 2 says that vengeance and wrath is, re is reserved for the Lord's enemies and adversaries. We are not appointed to wrath. Amen. Okay, and we move on. So I, I have done a video on um, what is the 70th week prophecy uh, of Daniel. And so I will try again to remember to link that in the description area. But I'm going to just give a sort of brief, I'm hoping it's going to be brief, I'm going to try to make it brief, uh, synopsis of uh, Daniel's 70th week. So Daniel's 70th week, we read in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, when the angel Gabriel, which was the same angel that gave um, uh, Mary the revelation that she was going to bring the Savior into the world. Um, and we read here um, that Daniel Remember, Daniel was fasting and praying for his people and for Jerusalem, for the people of Israel, for Jerusalem, who had broken the first covenant. And um, they, they, many of them were getting into idolatry. There was a lot of things they had done that were against what they had promised the Lord they would do when they agreed with uh, the first covenant. Um, so here, the angel Gabriel gives Daniel the, the lowdown on what's going to happen. And I'm... I'm, I'm putting it in simplest terms. And he tells Daniel what it is God said was going to happen. Um, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, Daniel's people, people of Israel of the first covenant, and upon the holy city, the holy city being Jerusalem, to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So the angel is telling Daniel by the end of this fulfillment, by the fulfillment of this decree, this is what it's going to take care of. It's going to make an end of sin, make reconciliation for iniquity, etc. cetera. Um, one thing I want to point out to you, when you look at the breakdown, which is later on in, in the same uh, page we're looking at, in, in, in the same screenshot we're looking at of Daniel 9, right? Chapter 9. Um, when we do the breakdown, when we, when we calculate, we will see that only 69 of that 70 week period, and it's weeks of years, uh, the word weeks means sevens, um, and you can look at that as 
uh, 70 times 7, which is 490 years, okay, they're weeks of years, that same word, weeks, uh, in the original language, that same word was the same word used um, for Jacob when he had to fulfill his week to get the wife, the bride he wanted, which was uh, Rachel, he had to fulfill another seven years, okay? So it's the same word um, and the same uh, idea. 70 weeks, 70 sevens, which is 70 times seven, it equals 490. But we know through the calculations and through the breakdown that we see, um, which again, I would refer you to the video, which will give you more detail about that, um, that uh, 69 of the 70 week prophecies have been fulfilled um, that's 483 of the 490 have been fulfilled, seven years are left. And that's what we mean about the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, uh, the seven-year period that has the great tribulation and the time of Jacob's trouble in it, where the days of vengeance begin. Okay, so we're given a breakdown. Um, you can pause it and go ahead and read it. I, I'm not going to because I'm not one that likes to ignore and I might go left and begin to explain each one of these things. So you can uh, pause it. But again, if you want to know more in detail about the breakdown and how I explain it, um, you can go ahead and view the video. I will try to link it in the description. Um, the, the, I do want to mention one more thing. Hold on one second. Where is it? Um, so in Daniel 9, 25 here, where it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, when Jesus rode in on the donkey into Jerusalem as the Messiah, right? Because that was prophesied. Um, he gives here um, from the time of the commandment to restore Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the the prince shall be seven weeks, so seven sevens, seven times seven, which is 49, and it's broken like this for a reason, and three score and two weeks. So three score means a group of 320, so 20, 40, 60, 62 weeks, 62 sevens, 62 times seven, which equals 434. Um, so from the, uh, when you add the 434 to the uh, 49, you get the 483 years. So 483 of the 490, um, seven years are left. So here we get um, uh, what, well, how we can calculate. And there is somebody, and I, I can't remember their name. They did a calculation um, and they, they used, I think it was the Jewish calendar that was used um, to calculate uh, the time from the commandment until Jesus rode in, right, on the donkey into Jerusalem as Messiah, as it was prophesied. And they said it fits it perfectly, the calculation as to the amount of time that it took. Since then, the clock has been paused. And we know that it begins again when the Antichrist confirms the covenant with many um, that begins that seven year period. It has not started. We are not in the seven year tribulation yet. There's a lot of false teachings, misinterpretations out there. We have to stick to the orders of the prophecies. And again, I speak more in depth in the um, 70th week video again, which I will link below. But let's talk about this commandment. What commandment? How do we know when that commandment started? Well, we read in Nehemiah 2, 1, through four. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, uh, in the 20th year of our tax services, the king, sorry, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Um, wherefore the king said unto me, why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid and said unto the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, for what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And then we read in, in Nehemiah 2, 5 to 8, and I said unto the king, if it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, 
unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, for how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, if it pleased the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertained to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Now we read in Ezra 7, 6 to 10, the following. This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his request, according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. And there went up some of the children of Israel, and the priests, and the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nethinim, sorry, unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, the king. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon, and on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. There's a reason I'm reading all for this. Bear with me. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and to, cheat, and to teach in Israel statutes and uh, judgments. And then we read on in, in Ezra 7, 11 to 15. Now this is the copy of the letter that the king Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe, even a scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings unto Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, um, perfect peace and at such a time, I make a decree, here's the decree, that all they of the people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee, for as much as thou art sent to the king and of his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem, according to the law of thy God, which is in thy hand, thine hand, and to carry the silver and gold, which the king and his counselors have freely offered unto the God of Israel, whose habitation is in Jerusalem. We continue reading. And all the silver and gold that thou canst find in all the province of Babylon, with the free will offering of the people and of the priests, offering willingly for the house of their God, which is in Jerusalem, that thou mayest buy speedily with this money bullocks, rams, lambs, and their meat offerings, and their drink offerings, and offer them upon the altar of the house of your God, which is in Jerusalem. And whatsoever shall seem good to thee and to thy brethren to do with the rest of the silver and the gold that, that do after the will of your God. The vessels also that are given thee for the service of the house of thy God, whose deliver thou before the God of Jerusalem. And whatsoever more shall be needful for the house of thy God, which thou shalt have occasion to bestow, bestow it out of the king's treasure house. Um, we continue, and I, even I, our taxerces, the king, do make a decree to all the treasures which are beyond the river, that whatsoever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, shall require of you, it be done speedily unto an hundred talents of silver and to an hundred measures of wheat and to an hundred baths, baths of wine and to an hundred baths of oil and salt without prescribing how much. Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? And we certify you that touching any of the priests and Levite singers, porters, Nethanims or ministers of the house of God, it shall not be lawful to impose toll, tribute, or custom upon them. So, who was Ezra in the Bible? Ezra was the second of three leaders to leave Babylon for the reconstruction of Jerusalem. Zerubbabel reconstructed the temple. We learned that in Ezra 3 8. Nehemiah, Nehemiah rebuilt the walls. 
Nehemiah chapter 1 and 2, and Ezra restored the worship. Ezra was a scribe and priest uh, sent with religious and political powers by the Persian king Artaxerxes to lead a group of Jewish exiles from Babylon to Jerusalem. Okay, and you can pause to read the rest of this, but I I want to make sure that you understand there's a reason why of all the decrees that we read in the Bible about the rebuilding of Jerusalem, why this one is the one that many um, do agree upon. Um, the, we read in God questions, the fulfillment of the 70 weeks, Gabriel said the prophetic clock would start at the time that a decree was issued to rebuild Jerusalem. From the date of that decree to the time of Messiah would be 483 years. We know from history that the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem was given by King Artaxerxes of Persia, um, 445 BC. And we got that from Nehemiah 2, 1 through 8. Um, here's a little information on Artaxerxes, um, died 425 BC. Um, let's see, reigned from 465 to 425 BC. Um, here, I, I wanted to outline the three different places that um, decrees were made and why this one, the one for um, our tax receipts, is the one that we believe is the one that dates um, from the time the command was given in Daniel 9 unto Messiah, okay? Um, we read the following. This is somewhat debatable as there are at least three decrees in the book of Ezra. The first is in Ezra 1, 1, 2, 4. This is a decree of Cyrus that the Jews can go back to Judah and Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. This decree is from about 537 BC. There is no mention of building the city and especially of rebuilding the wall, which is almost the definition of a city back then. So this is probably not what the prophecy is in reference to. Um, the second decree is that of Darius in Ezra 6, 1 through 12. This comes from about 518 BC. It is especially a renewal of Cyrus decree to rebuild the temple. And for the same reasons as above, this is probably not what the prophecy in Daniel 9 about a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem is referring to. The third decree, the third decree in Ezra is that of our tax receipts in Ezra 7, 11 to 28. This is a decree to actually rebuild the city. The decree comes from the seventh year of our tax receipts, uh, Ezra 7, 8. This is somewhere around 5, 458 BC from what we know of our tax receipts rain from outside sources. The decree actually resulted in the rebuilding of Jerusalem under Nehemiah. Okay, so that's why we believe um, this date over the others because of the detail that was involved in that decree. Okay, so Daniel 9, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, which is seven sevens or um, uh, uh, 49, right, weeks of years, um, plus the three score and two weeks, uh, which is 62 weeks. Um, and when you take the 49 and the 62 times seven, which is 480, 434, you get the 483. The street shall be built again, uh, and the wall even in troublous times. So we know that Israel has been surrounded by many a troublous times, right? So 70 weeks equals 70 sevens. 70 times seven is 490 years. That was the total of the decree that the angel Gabriel gave to Daniel. Um, the breakup of it, seven weeks equals seven sevens, or seven times seven, which is 49 years. Um, 60 and two weeks um, is 62, I meant to write sevens, or 62 times seven is 434 years. And when we take the 49 and we add that to the 434, um, it gives us 483. And that's as many years of that prophecy that has been fulfilled. Remember, it was originally for 490. There are seven years still needed to be fulfilled. Okay. All right. So um, we're going to go ahead and skip this because I think I've talked good about this. You can always uh, pause it. You just remind you if you want to. It is included, and again, in more depth um, in the video on the 70 week prophecy, which again, I will link below. Um, and this is just showing you where uh, when Jacob 
uh, was told that he had to fulfill another week for the bride he wanted, um, where this chapter um, defines week as seven years as well, in case you had any question on it, okay? So fulfill her week, seven other years, and he fulfilled her week. It's weeks of years, seven years, okay? Um, this is a chart that I have um, shared before, um, and I just kind of want to put in perspective for you. So let me get my little pointer. Today, we're in the church age of grace, right? At the last day of the church age of grace, the church is raptured before the seven years begins, okay? And this seven years has a lot of little nicknames for it in scripture when you're, when you're studying the prophecies that um, give you little nuggets to what will be happening around this time if you're trying to make your own chart or you want to write your own notes. Um, it's the, um, this is the church age of grace. Then we go up, right? The last day of the church age of grace. The seven years is the 70th final week of the 70 year week. I'm sorry, of the 70 week prophecy of Daniel, right? Um, the last seven years, uh, they're divided into two halves. This half will be less volatile than this half. But remember that we read in the second seal that peace will be taken from the earth. Um, today, we see symptoms of this time approaching, don't we? Um, we see, uh, and, and we're told perilous times will come. What we see is as if, you know, one pastor put it, if you were waiting for a bus at a bus stop and you could see the bus coming, your bus coming, but it's not yet there, right? But you see it coming, right? Um, and you feel the symptoms of people getting ready because they see the bus too. So they're standing up, kind of gathering their things. What we see today happening in the world on a global, global scale, everything, and I mean everything that you see, um, which I will detail um, much of what you're looking at around the world in part two of the prophecy, okay? Um, we will talk about it and we'll compare it to the actual verses um, that indicate to us the hour at hand, the hour that is approaching, right? The season that is coming, right? Um, so we want to make sure that we understand the basis, the importance, and the order of the Lord's prophecies and, and how we're told despise not prophecies. Don't make it an unimportant thing. Pay attention. We're told to watch. We're told to be awake. It's time to wake up, right? Spiritually wake up. Because many are spiritually asleep, many are spiritually blind. They have no idea what's coming, okay? And, and when you don't have your blessed hope, when you don't have uh, Jesus as your blessed hope, yeah, you are in fear. And even some Christians, the, the spirit of fear who is a liar has taken hold of many Christians' minds. But then that should question your faith. Do you truly believe all the promises that our Lord gave? Do you truly stand and trust on what he said? This is the greatest test of your faith is when you're in the midst of a storm. Now more than ever, ever you need to put on that armor and you need to bind the lying spirits that are, that are trying to make you feel bound in fear when you are set free. You are not a child who is left as an orphan. You have power. Greater is he in you than he that is in the world. Do you or do you not believe it? Then you have to act on it. Then you have to walk in it. Um, okay. So uh, another thing with respect to the prophecies, remember what we read in 2 Peter 3.8. Um, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Um, God is outside of time. You know, to us, it's been a couple thousand years since the Lord um, was on the earth. To the Lord, it's been a mere two days. You know, remember what we read in, in, in Psalm 94. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past as a watch in the night. Okay? God is outside of, the uh, outside of time. We're the ones confined to time and space. All right? Um, in, and I'm almost done, and thank you for your patience. Daniel 12, 4, we read, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. I have heard this verse butchered many times. I've heard many say, this is talking about airplanes, 
computers, but telephones, you know, um, wisdom of the world. But the Bible says that wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. So what is it that people in the last days are going to be running to and fro? And what knowledge is it that shall increase? Did you know that more and more today, more than ever, people are understanding the book of Revelation, which many pastors avoided for many, many, many years. So I want to show, I want to show you what we see happening today. Remember that though the book of Daniel was sealed, right? The book of Revelation is not sealed. John is told, don't seal it for the time is at hand, right? Um, but this book right here, the book of Daniel, when you study and you compare and you cross-reference uh, the book of Daniel with uh, the book of Revelation, you find they complement each other and they help you understand uh, the 70th week a lot better and, and beyond, because that's what we're talking about here. Um, what is coming to be? What are the signs um, uh, of things to come? You know, remember that what we read, uh, the Old Testament, um, what is written of our time was written for our learning, right? And we see that um, Daniel is told, during his time, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. Let me tell you something. The knowledge that shall be increased in these last days is knowledge of God, the mystery of Christ, and his kingdom. It's not of the world. Wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. It's not about airplanes. It's not about, yes, all that stuff is great. And yes, oh my goodness, how, how time has changed. But the knowledge being spoken of that many today are running to and fro is the knowledge of God, his Christ, and his kingdom. It's not about the world. You know, today there are many false prophets, false teachers, and false preachers, wolves in sheep's clothing. Let me tell you something. The work being done by the Holy Spirit, not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord, right? The work being done by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who provides the increase in a, in a, in a, in a born-again Christian. Um, my goodness, the Christian is seeking out the Lord's truth. They're getting in the Bible. You know, there are many who are spiritually awake. They're watching, right? They're studying prophecies. You're seeing, you're seeing many dive into prophecies unlike any other time in history. You know, this is not knowledge of the world, children of God. This is knowledge of God, his Christ, and his kingdom. And you can find that in, throughout scripture. And I'll try to add more uh, verses um, in part two of this video. Um, so you can see for yourself what God wants is for people uh, to understand the mystery of God, the mystery of, of his son, the mystery of the kingdom of God, uh, the mystery of the rapture, you know, the, the how many mysteries do we read of in the Bible, the, the truth of God, right? Um, that's what the Lord wants. Uh, how much is it that the Lord, uh, that we read in, in Joel, um, that the God is God is pouring out His Spirit, and many are prophesying, prophesying, knowing the wisdom from from above that is in the Bible, understanding the prophecies of the Bible of what's gonna what's gonna happen on the earth, right, and the time at hand, the seasons, the deep things of God, right. Um, so we read in Galatians 1, 1 through 5, Paul, an apostle, not of man, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Gal Galatia. Um, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this evil, from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. We know that a lot of what we're seeing today is prophetic, right? Nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Um, there are famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. We're seeing the beginning of sorrows right now. Um, and remember what we read. When these things begin to come to pass, then look up for your redemption draws near. You know, um, when we read of the word, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, nation, uh, it me it's the original Greek 1484 eth ethnos. 
And um, ethnos means a race, a nation. Um, uh, we read in the Helps Word study, uh, forming a custom culture, right? Properly people joined by practicing similar customs or common culture, nation usually referring to unbelieving Gentiles, but it means a race, a people, a nation, you know? Um, so what we're seeing today, you know, we've, we were seeing the wars and rumors of wars last how many couple of years, it was getting worse and worse, all, country, all the countries fighting, right? Um, but, but now we're seeing nation rise against nation. We're seeing the, the different nationalities fighting against themselves. You know, we're seeing that it's, it's prophetic. It's not something that has taken God by surprise. It's not something that you, child of God, should be fearful of. Um, you know, the word kingdom is speaking of royal power, um, kingship authority, rule, especially of God, both in the world and in the hearts of men, hence kingdom in the concrete sense. Um, we read here, uh, the realm in which a king, uh, uh, a king uh, sovereignly rules, um, a kingdom always requires a king. Uh, of God does the king Jesus. We see then um, that it Although we read of wars and rumors of wars, right? We, we have been reading of that. We do also see that many kingdoms are coming against each other. We have, you know, China, the United States. Uh, uh, we have um, Israel and Iran. There are so many places, so many kingdoms fighting against each other. And what are they all threatening with? You know, all kinds of nuclear um, um, tactics, scare tactics, I call them, and, you know, showing who has the bigger weapon and all these other things that you see. None of this has taken God by surprise. You are a child, as a child of God, are to be focusing on things above, not on things on the earth. Those who don't have their blessed hope, we're supposed to share the good news, pulling as many out of the fire as we can. You know, the Lord wants us to be a light in this ever-growing dark world, to be the salt of the earth. Remember what salt does. Two of the most popular qualities of salt. Salt preserves and salt adds flavor. We add flavor to people's life, guiding them to their blessed hope. We enrich their lives by guiding them to their blessed hope, which is Jesus. You know, um, as a salt to the earth, we preserve the Lord's truth. Remember how many times Jesus said, keep my word. If you keep my word in John uh, 14, right? And many other places in the Bible, the word that was translated to our English word king, keep is preserve. Um, as the salt of the earth, we are to preserve the Lord's truth. Preserve his truth. Um, stand firm, nothing wavering on what God said. Speak the truth boldly, right? Um, so... Uh, we, we want to also keep in mind that the Lord said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, that we have the Lord with us. He has not left us as orphans. Greater is he in us than he that is in the world. Nobody will take us out of his mighty hand. Stand firm, nothing wavering with Jesus Christ. The word of God is your firm foundation. You know, post, um, powerful verses on your refrigerator. So you look at them because it's so easy for the um, spirit of fear, which is a lying spirit, to try and find a home in your mind, child of God, to try to bind you when you have been set free. More than ever, you need to speak the word of God out loud. You need to make sure that you stand on it. Um, prayer is powerful. Pray ceaselessly. Um, pray, you know, remember Daniel prayed three times a day. Um, uh, also make sure that you understand what it means to pull the full armor, to put the full armor of God on and make sure that you have it on so that you're not confused, that you're not led to doubt, that you're not led to fear and, and be bound in fear when you have been set free. You're not to be shackled up again. So what do we do with all this information? You know, because there's, there's a lot that we have been seeing. There's a lot that that we've been told will happen in the Bible, um, but we are not blind to the enemy's tactics. Um, yes, the Antichrist will have a kingdom. Um, we believe we read that the false prophet will be preparing the way for the Antichrist, much in mockery of the. Uh, of the way that John the Baptist did. Remember that the enemy likes to mimic God and, and kind of mock his ways. So the enemy will have, you know, uh, uh, Jesus has a bride. The enemy will have uh, mystery Babylon. 
you know, um, the John the Baptist prepared the way for Jesus. Um, the false prophets will prepare the way for the Antichrist. Um, we know that the Antichrist will have um, a mark. Uh, uh, he will have um, that uh, a mark that he will try to seal those during the 70th week that take the mark to him. And if they do, they will receive his uh, fate, which we know that Satan is a defeated foe and he has a sentence on his head, right? And he only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He just wants to take as many with him as possible. So we know that what we see happening is um, in preparation for that 70th week. Listen, we're told certain things would exist during the 70th week, even a third physical Jewish temple. Today, excuse me, there exists, uh, the altar is made already for that third Jewish temple. Um, they dedicated it already. Um, they've chosen the high priest. It's in the works. We're close to that time. And if we know that Jesus will catch up his church before that time, how much closer are we to that time? Do you understand? So this is just um, a little bit of, uh, of what we see happening today and where it's headed. It has not come. The bus is not here yet. The 70th week has not yet come, but we see it approaching. We see the symptoms of that time approaching. You know, it's, it's like a hurricane. When it's approaching landfall, the closer it gets to landfall, even though it's not actually on landfall, you begin to feel the winds whipping. You, feel, you begin to feel the water, right? Um, when, you're, when you're living coastally. But what I'm trying to tell you is, Yes, we see symptoms. We see signs that show us that the time is approaching. We were told we would see signs. Jesus said the, these, are, these signs would indicate to us that the, time, that the time was near for his return and of the end of the age. It has not come yet, but we see the signs approaching and we should not be in fear. If anything, we should be um, more excited about the Lord's return and also sharing his good news, trying to excuse me, um, uh, pull as many out of the fire, right? Sharing the good news of salvation, praying for, for everybody, praying for your family um, to come to the Lord, to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, right? Um, so everything that we see, understand, none of it has taken God by surprise. Um, God is not surprised by what we're seeing on the earth. We know that we are given um, um, information that should signal to us that the time is near, how much more we're looking up that our redemption draws near, right? Um, if you're a, a woman of God, you're a warrior in this time, and, and you're blessed to be living in this time that we're in today, you know, if you're a man of God, a soldier of Christ, you are blessed to be living in this time that we're living in today. You know, we, we read in Galatians 3, 26 to 29, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. Ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You know, we have been given the privilege and honor and power to use the name of Jesus Christ to help us because the name of Christ has power. The name of Jesus has power. There is power in the name. In the name of Jesus Christ, bind with that which, you know, you, 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 the lying spirits that are, that are hindering you, that are attacking your family, that are attacking your, your marriages, bind them in Jesus' name by the power of Jesus' blood and by God's spirit. You've been given power. Use it. Walk in the power that you are given, the shoes that God has set before you. Walk in them. You're not to be crouched down in the fetal position, letting the enemy beat you. You are a child of God. Greater is he in you than he that is in the world. You've been given eyes to see and ears to hear. You have been given power and the authority to use Jesus' name to bind and, 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 and loosen. And, and heaven will agree with you. Do you understand? You know, um, this is one of the, my favorite verses, and I have it on my refrigerator. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. The strength that I have comes from the Lord. It's not mine. You know, um, when we walk in faith, not by sight, 
um, we're not focused on the things happening, on the problems of this world. We're praying for them. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're not citizens of, of this earth. We're citizens of heaven. And we need to remember that. We need to walk as children of God, you know, given power as the light of the world, as the salt of the earth, as ambassadors for the kingdom. Okay, we need to put the enemy in his place. Um, the Bible says, I have, the Lord said, I have given you authority, it says in this version, to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. You know, we need to walk in the power that we're given. Um, the Bible says, I will give you, the Lord said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Heaven will agree with you, child of God. Get to praying, get to binding, get to casting out. Walk as a kingdom warrior of God, um, as a soldier for Christ and for the kingdom. Um, Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. Do you understand that? You know, um, it, when he said, um, I, on this rock, I will build my church, he was talking on this rock, meaning him. He is the rock. Um, and many people twist it. He is the rock. You know, how do I know that? Well, 1 Corinthians 10, 4, the Bible interprets itself. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Jesus is the rock. Um, we read in John 10, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. You know, um, we read in Matthew twenty-eight eighteen, Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Um, Romans 8, 11, the same power that raised Christ from the dead is inside of you. Um, Ephesians 1, and God placed all things under his feet, under whose feet? Under Jesus' feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Do you understand? We belong to the one seated above all who has all under his feet. Um, in Ephesians 1, 14, we read, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. We are his purchased possession and he is coming for us. He said it, what God spoke will not return to him void. Jesus is the word of God, the word of God of which God um, speaks things into existence with, and we are his purchased possession. We belong to him. We're waiting for the day of redemption. We are sealed into the day of redemption. We're waiting for the redemption of our bodies, Romans 8 says. We need to trust on the words, on the word of God and everything that he has spoken. Put the verses, powerful verses, somewhere you can read it every day in these dark times, because the enemy is trying to bind you in fear when you have been set free. Okay, John 14, 2, 3, and I am closing. I, I, I thank you for your patience. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Um, 2 Peter 2, 9, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. And that word temptations is the same word used in Revelation 3.10, um, where the Lord tells us that uh, he will keep us out of the hour of temptation. Temptation in the original language, calamity, affliction. That hour, that space of time, that 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. Um, Revelation 3.10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. If you are kept from something, you are not going to be cast into that time. Um, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Remember what we read in Revelation 1, 17 to 19. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet. This is John speaking as dead. Remember, John knew Jesus. 
And here he is looking at the resurrected, um, glorified Jesus Christ. And he writes, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. In Isaiah 45, 18, we read, For thus said the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He, hath, he created it, not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Um, in Isaiah 45, 22, we read, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Jeremiah 32, 27. Remember, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. We have to put on the whole armor. We have to walk in the power we're given as children of God, not cower down and in the fetal position on the ground when we have been given power. We belong to the one seated above who has all under his feet. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. 2 Timothy 4, 8. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Uh, one more thing I wanted to bring up, which I thought was very interesting. And I thought I put the website to where this was from. I did not. Um, according to the person who created this, from Adam to Abraham, it was 2,000 years. From Abraham to Jesus, it was 2,000 years. And from Jesus to today, it's been 2,000 years. I'd say we're on time for what the Lord is doing next. Um, if you do not know the Lord, I encourage you, please say the sinner's prayer. Um, you're, we're told how we're saved. It's not a difficult thing. If you want to know Jesus and you don't know Jesus, you go to the privacy of your room, some prayer closet, somewhere where you can privately pray and kneel down and with your heart engaged. Um, um, you, you confess your sins, confess you're a sinner and believe in your heart that Jesus was raised from the dead and, and call to Jesus tell him that that you you are inviting him into your heart to forgive you for your sins um you know uh, uh to send you his holy spirit um that you want him to be lord and savior of your life he will fill you with the holy spirit you will begin to see with new eyes to hear with new ears spiritual wisdom from above buy yourself the holy bible um, um and go to a church where they do full immersion a water baptism uh, in Jesus' name, you want a Christian, born-again Christian church uh, that teaches the truth from the Bible, and I encourage you to please say this prayer. Um, and if you have said this prayer, I, I welcome you into the fam family of God. You have so many who, who, who love you and who will welcome you uh, into, into the sheepfold of the Lord, okay? And so now, this is the end. This is it. Um, for part two, I want to detail and match the, some of the things that are happening, some of the very important highlights of what, what is happening today and match them with Bible prophecy. And I will try to get that out by the end of this week, if not tomorrow. Okay, let's close in prayer. Father Almighty God, I just thank you so very much for everything that you have given us this time we have together, for every person that has tuned in and made it through the entire teaching, Lord. I just pray that you bless and sanctify your people, Father. Encourage them. Send a multitude of your protective angels, warring angels, holy angels with Holy Spirit fire to surround, watch over, protect, and intervene for each and every one of them, Lord. Fill them with Holy Spirit and Holy Spirit fire. Father, I pray that you fill them with your peace, which surpasses all human understanding. And Father, just guide them. Guide their hearts, guide their minds during these difficult times, these un unprecedented times 
place, Lord, I just pray that it is you, that they feel your presence, that they feel you near them, Lord, and your love and your and your goodness and your grace, Father, the power that you have for them. And I, I pray, Father, that you give them all eyes to see and ears to hear only your truth away from the lies and the confusion of the world and the enemy. In Jesus' name we pray. I thank you, Father. I praise you. I give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and all God's children say, Amen. I would encourage you, please, if you have not already, please subscribe. Make sure you hit the bell near the subscribe button so you'll be alerted as to uh, when I, I uh, upload new content. Um, make sure that you like and share. And I thank you so much for um, sharing this time with me. God bless you. Love you guys. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.